Thank you for bringing us uh, a little closer in time and space than the previous talks. Uh, questions? Yes? A few years ago, I had an opportunity to question a large group of biologists about the question of whether if one were to imagine the conditions that existed on Earth four billion years ago, whether life was something that was essentially inevitable or a rare accident. And this group of people divided essentially evenly between thinking that it would be likely to happen and that it was a rare accident. I then asked another biologist whom I respected very much and he said he was surprised anyone would be so bold as to venture an opinion. Well, that was some time ago. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking that Martin Rees was of that uh, 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 opinion. I'm wondering what, what your view is of the modern view of that. And then the other question is, how long before you can make good enough measurements that we'll know? <laughs> so the first answer is, is that it's a fundamental question, right? If life would inev inevitable uh, occur or not. And with all our scientific knowledge, we don't know because we have no way of making life in the lab yet. And that would be something that would be needed to figure out if we jigger with the conditions, if it always would come, if it never would come, how constrained these conditions are. So the search for signatures of life on other planets actually also is a tool to address that. And it might be the faster tool, because if you ask a biologist when they expect to be able to make life in the lab, the answer is tomorrow or in 3,000 years. So, you know, uh, a half split as you were talking about. But if you were to find signatures of life of only hot planets or on only cold planets or on planets where you know they must have been hotter early on, then you can start to constrain the signatures of life or the conditions that life would need. And so I'm trying to talk my biology com uh, uh, colleagues into actually venturing adventurers out and telling me how life would... Uh, how would life would actually develop? And this is why I showed you the extremes of life on our own planet, because that's the only safe uh, model that I can use, because uh, my colleagues very much disagree how life would actually evolve if it were completely different. Uh, different condition, different UV range, different kind of uh, light, maybe like a red star instead of a uh, yellow star. And so it's a fundamental question that the search can answer. And coming to your second question with that, is that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch in 2018 and is a 6.5-meter telescope in space. For the first time, but under the caveat that's on the limit of technical possibilities, if we have a planet like analog to Earth around one of our closest stars, for the first time it will be powerful enough that we can collect enough light to tell the difference between an atmosphere that shows signs of life and an atmosphere that doesn't. It will require hundreds of hours. And so if you know space telescopes, people don't like to give you hundreds of hours. So we probably can test this on one or two if we're lucky because it's such a fundamental question. But with the bigger telescopes coming online also on the ground, the 40 meter telescope in Chile, that will actually also allow us to do it from the ground and the difference is that in the from the ground, if you look for something that's in our own atmosphere, you need to be able to tell apart the signatures that our atmosphere shows versus the one from the other planet. And so the only way you can do that is with very high resolution. So you can see the movement of the light from the, star that mo from the planet that moves around another star versus our movement, the Earth around the sun. And therefore, you need a 40-meter telescope and a couple of years of observation time from the ground. So we're living in this exciting time that it is a possibility. It's going to be incredibly hard. But uh, if it's on the verge of technical possibility, humankind usually has a beautiful way of making it work somehow. Well, I want to ask you, wha what is uh, the idea of world? Because you, you say, through 100 new worlds. But in reality, it's all the uni world. What is your concept of world? So I. 
I usually use the concept of worlds because a distinction I didn't go into is that this could be a moon around a giant planet as well. So by calling it world, instead of always saying planets and moons, it just shortens it a little bit. My concept of a world, and thanks for bringing that up, I should have been clear, clearer, is something that is smaller than two Earth's radii because we have no object that's smaller than two Earth's radii that's not a rock that we found yet. So we use two Earth's radii or smaller for a rocky planet. And then at the right distance where it's not too hot or too cold for liquid water on the surface. And that's not a requirement at all for life as we know it. But if I am further out and I have an ice layer on top of an ocean that could host life as we know it, that ice layer will block gases that that life produces from entering the atmosphere. And with a remote telescope, the only access I have, if I can fly to that star, is the light that filters through the atmosphere. So the amazingly beautiful pictures we saw from Europa, we'll need to go there, we'll need to drill a hole, we need to look in the ice and we need to look down. If you put Europa around a star far away from us, there's no way for me to tell whether there's life on that planet. So with world, I mean a rock at the right, uh, so I mean a rock actually. So actually no, as I, as I said generally, thousands of worlds, I mean any planet or moon, so it should be more than that. And then an Earth-like world, so a habitable world, is a two Earth radii or smaller, and there seems to be, we have 30 identified so far, and we're finding more and more, as I said, every day, they're hard to find. And then at the right distance, so that there could be liquid water, and we have 30 of those planets right now, 30 potentially habitable worlds right now. And if we're really lucky, um, we'll figure out from the science of the light from those whether or not we're alone in the universe pretty soon. Thank you, Martin, please. Not too bad convincing. <laughs> Pardon? Because, uh, sorry, Be because uh, we, we, we say new systems, a new, new sol solar system or, or other system, but world really, we understand only the war, our system. I don't understand. Sorry. That is actually perfect because I never, uh, for me, world is such a global thing because we call, for example, Europa, the icy moon, an ice world or an ocean world. But I think when you start to translate to different languages, like when I say this in German, I will use different words than if I do this in English. And so I assume in, Italy, in Italian, it's also going to be a different common connotation when you say world. Mundo? I don't know. Martin. The most exciting thing would obviously be to find evidence for life, but it would be quite interesting to find topographic features. And can you say a bit about that? Because, for instance, if you looked at the Earth from far away, then the Pacific Ocean side might be different from the Eurasia side. And can you say a bit about the possibilities of finding if there are topographical features like that on these other planets? Absolutely. So the interesting thing, in a way, is that it will be much easier for us to pick up signatures of life or gas signatures than any topographic information because the resolution I would need is at least four pixels or two pixels for the whole planet if you, you have like a half hemisphere. Sorry, I, I wasn't thinking of spatial resolution. I was thinking that uh, if they're oh. rotating, Sorry. Uh, yes. th then uh, uh, w w if you looked at the Earth and when the Pacific Ocean faced you, mm -hmm. you might get a different spectrum from when uh, it was away from you. No, uh, absolutely. I wasn't thinking of spatial resolution. So the key thing there is that um, clouds actually very much temper what you can read out in topography. Uh, and so what you would need is a signal good enough one twelfth of the rotation period of the planet. Let's assume it's an Earth. So your signal from your telescope would have to be good enough, or you, it'd have to be good enough in two hours observation, so that in the end effect, you could take out the component of clouds on the overall spectrum because clouds are very bright and then get to topography features. And then you could see things rotating in and out of view. The papers that have been written about this are insofar fun because they just assume no clouds. 
because clouds are very hard to model. And if you assume no clouds, then the ocean is very dark and the continents are pretty bright, 30% of reflectivity. And then you have a nice way to actually figure out what the rotation period of the planet is, as long as you assume it's topographic features that you see rotating in and out of view. In our own solar system, we don't have a planet without clouds. I'm discounting Mercury here with no atmosphere. Mars has thin clouds, so that would be easier, but it doesn't have any change in topography. So if Mars rotates, it would basically always show you a similar color and a similar brightness. If you want to go to something like an Earth or some planet that has water, then most likely you should contend with clouds. And so then you get back to the problem that to take the signatures of clouds that have 80 to 90% of reflectivity out, you get, need to go back to very high resolution. But in principle, especially if you could invoke a non-cloudy planet, you could get to topography features. But in a way, it's funny that it would be easier if life exists to actually find those signatures before you'd figure out if half of the planet is covered in water. Thank you. Oh, just a last question, uh, Steve Shu. Yeah. Lisa, um, uh, certainly an oxygen atmosphere and methane uh, carbon dioxide is a good signature for large amount of photosynthetic life. Tell, tell us more about um, life in extremophile conditions where you just need this source of energy, not solar. So I can tell you what we've done so far in terms of colors. So we basically got the ideas by going to Yellowstone. I was walking through there and I figured, oh, it's really pretty different colors. And then my biology friends were telling me it's different kind of biota. But there does not exist any measurements what extremophiles actually produce in terms of gas exchange. And that is one of the fundamentals that I would need to actually be able to figure out if there's something that can be mimicked by geology. And that's one of the things we are currently doing in the lab, trying to get these measurements. So we've said, okay, colors first and assuming that it's photosynthesis, so still oxygen. But now we're trying to branch out and say, if the environment were different, and for whatever reason, oxygen wouldn't start. Hydrogen is a really interesting contender, H2, but the problem is keeping H2 on a planet because it escapes really readily. So... But I was thinking more of things like, you know, iron oxide. There's other things that could be sources of energy. Uh, maybe he, you can make a comment on that. So what Steve uh, referred to, uh, it doesn't need to be oxygen. So you, if you have uh, hydrogen, you can have sulfur, for example. You have something can oxidize uh, things. Uh, even nitrogen mm -hmm. can be uh, forming ammonia, for example. So um, what's that uh, possibility? So, so, so far, the assumption you have is based on what we know on the Earth is the, uh, the DNA you know, we have right here. Uh, using water and oxygen, there could be other choice as well. There is actually a very big, um, big body of work on this, and it mostly sits with the geology departments. So, for example, also Sarah Seager at MIT is trying to develop something like that. But it's been interesting, it's been shown by uh, Jim Casting from Penn State, that these alternative signatures of life that have been proposed for different kind of chemistries can be mimicked by geology. And so this is when you start to lose its unique features. But we are looking for anything else. So if I can rope you two in, absolutely. I will be happy to model anything you can come up with. I think we have to stop there, this uh, important discussion, and move to the last paper of the Georges Lemaitre session. And we'll then focus really on uh, uh, Monsignor Lemaitre with uh, Thomas Sertog talk on the figure and legacy of Monsignor Lemaitre. Thank you.